psychoanalytic researchers had said, look, people do various things. They, they'll do things in groups that they wouldn't possibly do as individuals. And there is this kind of group behavior. And they did this in order to understand individuals and to understand you know, how they could help them come to terms with perhaps things that they'd done that they were ashamed of. What Bernays and the advertising people and the public relations school did was to turn that totally on its head and say, ah, if people will do things in groups that they wouldn't do normally, perhaps if we can influence group thinking in some way, we can get more and more people to do something. For example, perhaps we can get women to smoke and increase the number of, of people consuming cigarettes every year. Mm -hmm. um. Just, I mean, because you, you went back to the Second World War and I, I was quite curious about if Bernie was able to see, to predict the future, what was coming up, actually, while, while he was well, writing it, the... No, he, he, I don't think Bernays did, he wrote in his biography, the fact that he knew that Goebbels had a copy of his book on his bookshelves because somebody told him, he actually mentions that in his biography. The person that actually saw what was coming up was Freud, of course, because he wrote this book, Civilization and then its malcontents, um, you know, in which he, he warned people about the dangers of using unconscious drives for mass persuasion, but by that time it was too late. But Freud saw what was coming. And curiously enough, he saw what was coming on a global scale. He didn't actually see it personally. It wasn't until his daughter, Anna, was arrested by the Gestapo and grilled um, one day that he decided that it was time to, to get out of um, Austria and, and migrate to London. He, was, he, he felt that you know, he was going to be okay mm -hmm. until then. Uh, so you said that Freud was able to see, uh, at least predicted what was mm. coming up mm. as a as a as a as a person mm. uh, or a psychoanalyst. Analyst. But what about camera? Can the camera see the future? Well, some people say it can. Some people can't say it is nonsense. Um, I think the camera sometimes can see the future, but I think really it's the it's something about the person behind the camera that sees the per the future. But the person that behind the camera probably doesn't see it consciously. They see bits of it, and then the photograph reveals the future in some way. So I think, you know, I would, was, was talking both in, uh, in the presentation and also I write about in the book this photograph by Henri Cartier-Bresson, which was taken behind a French railway station in the same month that Hitler came to power. And it's a photograph of a man leaping off of a flat ladder uh, into what um, looks like a big puddle, but we don't know how deep it is. And it has various symbols in it, like a broken, broken wheels and uh, gravestones and a clock that says 20 past 12 and uh, a sign that says Raylowski, which sounds like um, uh, a Jewish rail transportee. And uh, that photograph can be interpreted as a, a warning of what, in fact, of saying it's, it's too late. You know, we've gone too far already. The, the, there, is, uh, there is trouble ahead for Europe and the world. Um, and people connect that with a, a dream that Jung had in which he saw fields of red blood and a voice saying to him, you know, this is real, this is going to happen. <laughs> being the predictor of the First World War, of course. So you, you mentioned that actually it's not the camera, but the person who uses the camera, behind the camera. Yeah. And what do you, rec I wouldn't say a recommendation, but what do you suggest, what do you need to be able to see, see, the, see, the, uh, see the future as someone who's taking a photograph? Well, look, your question actually goes back to something else. I mean, but, in one of my interludes away from photography, I have to wonder what were the conditions that would be necessary in order to create or see a synchronicity. And it's quite interesting because um, I once went to a workshop called uh, Deep Body Work and Religious Experience. And um, it was a Jungian sort of based workshop. And there were synchronicities going off 
all the time within that workshop. It was really, really very, very bizarre. Somebody had a Calvary experience where they had stigmata in their hands. Um, somebody was sort of having a, a kind of a spiritual awakening and a peacock came to the window and opened its tail and tapped on the window. Um, somebody was expressing frustration with something and there was this huge thump from the ceiling, thump, thump, thump on the ceiling, indicating that they needed to make more, more noise. So um, I think the first thing is you have to be prepared uh, to answer your question. You, you actually have to be prepared either for a synchronicity to take place or for a photo, or to take a photograph that's going to reveal the future. I mean, the night that Cartier-Bresson went out to take this photograph in France, he said, I am going to take an important photograph. You know, this is in his biography. No, he didn't know that he was going to take a photograph that might predict the future. He might have thought he was going to take a popular photograph, but I mean, he had this intention in some way, and some way a connection seems to have, have, have taken place at that time. So that has to be, it has to be a willingness to do something like that. Now, of course, there are people that have taken photographs that have predicted the future, and they've been, uh, have predicted bad f futures for the photographers. There was a, one of the members of the Bang Bang Club, I can't remember what his name is, but the Bang Bang Club is this group of four photographers from South Africa who documented a lot of um, apartheid and Encarta um, activity. Um, and he took a photograph that won the prize. And it's a picture of a, an emaciated girl who's trying to get to a refugee um, station to get fed. And there's a vulture behind the girl. And um, it won this wonderful prize. And he was elated about it. But then he got a lot of criticism. They said, well, you know, what did you do about the vulture? And did you help the girl to get to the, to the refugee station? And uh, he kind of fudged the answers to these questions. Well, of course, I, you know, scared off the vulture, and I don't know what happened to the girl. But he died. He died. He killed himself. Uh, and sometime later, you know, this image and this thing had, had haunted him in some way. And so, in a sense, you know, he was the girl, and the vulture was on his back. By predicting the future, I understand. Huh? By predicting the future, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. For, uh, being in Ethnograph again. Well, it's a uh, pleasure. So, Nasipal.